Hi, I'm Michael Odia, SolarWinds contributor and president and CTO of Tech Inc. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about choosing the right SQL Server availability technologies. SQL Server has a number of different high availability technologies. Uh, for protection at the server level, there's always on failover clustering instances. For protection at the database level, there's always on availability groups. And also, for at the database level, there's database mirroring. And for disaster recovery, there's log shipping. And finally, there's replication. In this presentation, we're going to compare these and have a quick look and see which of these technologies is best suited to which kind of scenarios. First, let's talk about uh, Windows failover clustering and always-on failover clustering instances. With uh, Windows failover clustering, this can provide guest-to-guest -guest protection. If your SQL Server systems are running in VMs on your host, you can fail over from one uh, VM to another VM that's running on that same host. Or if you have a shared storage solution like this one, like for instance an iSCSI or Fiber Channel SAN, then your failover cluster can span hosts and you can fail over virtual machines that are running on host number one to um, host number two. So your, your cluster is able to span different hosts out there. And in addition, of course, failover clustering can also be used to protect the virtualization host as well. So for instance, if there's a a host failure, like virtualization, can sometimes have a single point of failure. Then you could have your hosts on a Windows failover cluster network, and then all your virtual machines could fail over from one host to the next if there is a host failure. Uh, Windows failover clustering, you can have with Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2, you can have clusters of up to uh, 64 different nodes, which is quite a few. So it gives you protection from that. If you install SQL Server on a failover cluster, for instance, with failover cluster as a failover clustering instance, then you don't do the normal installation of SQL Server. Instead, you'd run the SQL Server Installation Center, and then you would select the option for new SQL Server failover clustering installation. And then when you do the remaining nodes in your cluster, you would run the SQL Server Installation Center, and then you'd select the option Add Node to a SQL Server failover cluster. So this is different than a standalone um, instance of SQL Server. And in this case, if there's a server failure with failover clustering, then the SQL Server service would be restarted on one of the remaining cluster nodes, and then all the transactions, which would be stored on that shared storage solution, would be reapplied to that new service once it started. Sometimes this can be lengthy depending upon uh, how busy that SQL Server system is. Next, let's talk about always-on availability groups. Uh, they were first introduced with uh, SQL Server 2012, and they were kind of like the next evolution beyond database mirroring. Uh, basically, with always-on availability groups, you get uh, near real-time log shipping as transactions are, uh, are committed or applied to uh, your primary server, then they are automatically replicated to your replica servers. Uh, with always-on availability groups, you can have up to eight different replicas, two of which can be uh, synchronous, and you can freely mix and match uh, synchronous and asynchronous replicas together. It does provide for automatic failover. Uh, the failover in the case of an always-on availability group is very, very fast. It's typically much faster than you might get out of a, an always-on failover clustering instance. Typically, it's only a few seconds. Uh, one thing about this, though, it does require a Windows failover cluster. But the installation here for always-on availability groups is different. With always-on availability groups, you do not select the Windows failover clustering installation options. Instead, you are doing standalone implementations of SQL Server on all of the different cluster nodes. Uh, one thing you might note is that there is full feature support for many of the advanced features in SQL Server, like in-memory OLTP, contained databases, the file stream data type, file tables, service brokers. There's support for all of that with Windows failover, um, with Windows avail always on availability groups. So how does this compare to a failover cluster? Well, with failover cluster instances, the, the protection is server level. So you're getting protection for your whole uh, SQL Server instance. With always on, it is at the database level. So you're protecting uh, one or more user databases. Failover clustering instances do require shared storage. 
always on availability groups don't need shared storage you can use direct attached storage if you want to uh, both of them support both automatic and manual failovers the time to failover though for a failover clustering instance uh, can be short if the if the server is not very busy and there aren't a lot of transactions to reapply but for a very large very busy server it could be many minutes sometimes 20 minutes or more depending on the workload uh, typically with an always-on availability group the time to failover is quite fast typically less than 30 seconds sometimes just a couple seconds Windows failover clustering can have uh, passive secondaries. Your secondary systems out there can just wait for a failover to happen. With always-on availability groups, you can have passive secondaries, but you can also have active secondaries, where those secondary systems out there uh, can provide workloads, such as read-only workloads for reporting or backup purposes. It is important to note, though, if you do use active secondaries, then you do have to license those secondaries. And with failover clustering instances, you're basically getting one SQL Server instance that is installed as a clustered instance. With always on, as I noted, uh, you have multiple SQL Server instances. So it's basically standalone SQL Server instances on each of those always on availability group nodes. And remember, you can have up to eight different replicas for your always on availability groups. Next, let's talk a little bit about database mirroring. Database mirroring was first introduced back with SQL Server 2005, so it's an older technology. It was sort of the precursor to always-on availability groups. It worked much the same, where uh, transactions from your primary SQL Server are forwarded to a mirror server. It is much more limited, though, than always-on availability groups. Uh, you are limited to one mirror server. That mirror server, the the database that's out there uh, cannot be accessed, so it's in recovery mode only. Um, you do have protection for only a single user database. There is not multiple user database protections. And uh, you had to choose between implementing this uh, with synchronous or asynchronous connections, so you couldn't mix and match the two. However, it does provide for automatic failover. It also provided for a very fast failover, typically in just a few seconds. And there is a transparent client redirection, so that automatic failover, the clients will be reconnected to that mirror server in the event of a failure. Uh, the advantage of database mirroring is that for some shops that uh, don't want to deal with clustering, it doesn't require a cluster. You can implement database mirroring without having a Windows Server failover cluster. So it is a bit simpler, but its limitations are such that you probably don't want to implement this nowadays. You'd probably want to use um, always on availability groups. Plus, uh, Microsoft has announced that they are going to depreciate database mirroring, and this is probably going to be the last um, a release of SQL Server, that is SQL Server 2016, will be the last release where database mirroring is included. Next, let's talk a little bit about log shipping. Log shipping has been around with SQL Server, uh, it seems like forever now, for uh, all the, the past recent releases. Uh, certainly since before SQL Server 2000. It is definitely a disaster recovery kind of um, technology where you take a backup of your databases, you apply that backup to a standby SQL Server system, and then you forward transaction log backups from that primary to one or more standby SQL Server systems. Uh, there is no automatic failover. Um, it is. It can be near real time or close to it. If as it can be as frequently as a stored procedure runs on that primary to forward those transaction logs to the secondaries, uh, but it's not anywhere near as real time as you would get with database mirroring or um, always on availability groups. So it is there is a delay in there, and of course with log shipping it is a manual process. There is no automatic failover. It's a manual failover or a manual fail back. Finally, let's talk a little bit about replication. Uh, replication, it can be used as a high availability technology, and many companies do it, but that's not really what it's designed for. It's really designed for uh, distributed databases and distributed reporting kind of scenarios. Um, it is. It, it does have the advantage of allowing you to filter uh, whatever data elements you want to replicate between different servers. That's an advantage that it has over the other technologies. But it is an entirely manual process. So it's a manual failover. It's a manual fail back. And in the case of replication, failing back, it can be an involved and complicated process that's kind of a pain. And so that makes it not as well suited for high availability as some of the other technologies we've discussed. That's the end of this presentation. I thank you for watching.